Welcome to the Kara's Cure Show, where we explore the cutting edge of wellness. Well, the teen mental health crisis is certainly causing a lot of strife in families, but what if you need help? Where do you go? What should you do? We are joined by Dr. Christine Schlichting, who just opened up uh, a pri the first ever privately owned mental health practice with an open adolescent intensive outpatient program. It's actually in Glastonbury, Connecticut. She is the director of Hopewell Health Solutions and a licensed psychologist herself. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Let's start with why you decided that you had to create this center. Mm -hmm. um, so what was happening is we were having a lot of kids um, the level of acuity was increasing significantly. So, um, you know, there's definitely a place for therapy, but there's also a time when therapy is not appropriate anymore, um, where a child might be self-harming, um, not able to go to school regularly, really isolating and shutting down, and um, is really opting out of doing the normal things that a teen should do and should be interested in doing. And at that point, we were sending kids to um, IOPs and sometimes also inpatient um, hospital stays. And the problem with that is, obviously, I know as a parent, there's nothing scarier than when right. your child isn't doing well yeah. for whatever reason. Um, problems exactly. at school or, like you said, left over from the pandemic. And even before that, we've yeah. seen a lot of anxiety. We're going to get into why there's so much anxiety coming up. But um, if you don't know what to do, that's the scariest thing mm -hmm. for a parent. So what do you do? Um, the first thing to do is to, I mean, if so if you have a therapist, you can call your therapist, but if you don't have a therapist, you can also dial um, 988, which is actually a mental health crisis line, but they will actually talk to you through your issues and try to get you set up with an appropriate program. Okay. There's also 211 as well. Um, what we've been doing is we sent um, kids out to uh, um, outpatient facilities and inpatient, and there it was very inconsistent in terms of when kids came back, if they were better or not. You're so, saying sometimes they actually went to these hospital programs and you found worse. your patients were becoming worse. Yes. Um, so Why? One of the, so with IOP, one of the big issues is, is all other facilities um, take anybody. So they'll take whatever your diagnosis is, they put all of the kids and even adults too into the same IOP. And an IOP is an intensive outpatient program, mm -hmm. which just basically means that your child is going to go after school or something for exactly. at least a few hours a day, yep. several times a week. Right. And you have a team of people working with you. So you don't just have one therapist, you'll have like three or four clinicians and then you'll also have a psychiatrist. So um, it really is different in that it's a mini team of people that are all working together and okay. we also work very closely with the family so the transformative process should be accelerated in an IOP. And so you have a new place in Glastonbury. I do. And I yeah. get calls all the time and emails, uh, maybe some of you who are watching or listening on the podcast of, okay, I need a therapist. My child, you know, I, I just think she needs help or he needs help. And then I often will try and give some names or mm -hmm. refer to people I know. And then you hear uh, there's waiting lists because uh, people like you are in so demand right now. Yeah. Uh, with your center, you can take people right away right now? Yes. Yeah, we, can, we need to do intakes. We need to make sure people are appropriate. Um, but absolutely, we do have openings, and we can also get people immediate care um, with a psychiatrist and with a therapist. So, so that's the other thing is it's so hard if people haven't done this before. Oh, yeah. Or it's hard because the kids don't want to go. Right. So you have everybody in one place. Yes. Yep. So, um, yes, it's a, it's a full-spectrum service. So you can have um, your psychiatrist appointment, your therapy appointment, um, family appointments, and then now the IOP. And when kids are done with the intensive program, we then uh, follow them and continue to have them in therapy and also meeting with the psychiatrist so that when they're discharged, which is another issue 
issue with other um, IOPs or other facilities is they just send kids back home with nothing. Um, mm. And it really doesn't make any sense because, um, as you know, it's not an on or off switch with mental health. So who would need to go to an IOP versus just a therapist? Mm -hmm. um, so specifically kids that have very severe anxiety. So for our program, it's very severe anxiety, depression, um, that they're not able to function normally in the real world. They're mm -hmm. not able to get to school. They're not interested in doing outside activities. They're not communicating very well. Um, they are really sort of um, either angry or very isolated and that sort of vacillation between those two irritable mm -hmm. moods. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really somebody who, and specifically with social anxiety, social anxiety really is cured more in a group format. And what is social anxiety? We hear yeah. that a lot, and I, I want to stress, a lot of these terms are used a lot on the internet, and right. that's another problem. Yeah. Kids yeah. are self-diagnosing, they might not yeah. even have this, but right. like true social anxiety, you'll hear that a lot, especially with teen girls, like I've got social anxiety, they, my social anxiety won't let me go into the mall yeah. right now, or right. this or that. Right. And, and there might be a little difference, I guess, between I'm afraid that someone from school is in there versus exactly. I can't function. So right. what is social anxiety? Social anxiety is when um, the child will just say, I I can't communicate with other people. I feel like everyone's looking at me. I'm um, you know, afraid of talking to people. Uh, you'll often see kids like this in the hall. Um, school People that work in schools will tell me that the child really has a very hard time like moving through the hallway mm. to get to class. They're afraid to you see know, all those they're other afraid, kids. Um, they're afraid of the cafeteria. Um, sort of large crowds, uh, but even just like regular social contact. Um, like, does your child have friends? Do they have, are they communicating? Are they, um, do they have, you don't need a lot of friends, right? But like one friend that is really a valued friendship mm -hmm. um, where they actually really do engage with each other. And um, we are finding there are some kids who just are really afraid of their peers um, because they've had some bad reactions actions and then it slowly has become severe social anxiety which then becomes a social phobia. And the bad reactions, I mean, we all remember Mean Girls, right? Sure. I mean, we've seen the movie or growing up, I can remember, you know, being bullied by a girl named Kelly where, yeah. like, your whole day depended, did she like you or not like yeah. you? So this is stuff that parents are like, okay, that's kind of normal. Yeah. I've been through that. These these are tough years. But what's not normal and when do we need to step in? Yeah, when they're staying in their bedroom and they're not wanting to come out, um, they're sleeping way too much, mm. they're eating way too much. Um, they or look, not eating or not eating yeah so like just the the average basic things that people do every day yeah. you know are they able to um, go to family events are they able to socialize with people are they um, showing interest in other things mm -hmm. um, or does everything seem very flat you know, yeah. to them. Um, and then, you know, because the, the anxiety and the depression are very closely linked like together. They are, unfortunately. So is there a difference for boys and girls? Yeah, so I think overall, girls um, like, this is what we found in, in our practice. Girls may self-identify, um, maybe due to a lot more social media influence, um, and they'll be quicker to say, I have anxiety, or I, I have this, or I have borderline personality disorder, or I have, it's almost like a like a catchy phrase now. Right, which we talked about that right. on this show also, yeah. that we don't want people diagnosing no. on TikTok. No. You need a, this is a serious thing that you want um, an expert like you to diagnose. Right. And and also, you might have anxiety for a day, but right. that doesn't mean you need to uh, be treated for anxiety right. if it's not over a period of time showing Correct. up in all spheres of your life. Correct, yeah, okay. absolutely. So whereas boys tend to more um, isolate and sort of just don't interact with anybody and maybe 
tend to be more angry or gaming a lot more, which um, gaming really can be a very significant addiction. Okay. Um, just like... What about just how they go to their rooms and scroll social media? Right. Is right. that a normal... I feel like that's a normal teen behavior nowadays. But... It's a normal human behavior, you yeah. know? I mean, and that's the reality, but you also have to recognize that some of the smartest people in the world work in the tech industry and have created addictive devices. Yes. So we have to be smarter than those devices and we have to use them as though they are an addictive substance. Instead of using, having it use you. Right. And let's just exactly. talk about that because we're going to get into the social media thing. I think everyone wants to know about why are we're seeing, you know, huge increases in teens going to the emergency room. Yeah. Um, suicide rates are up. Yeah. We're seeing uh, you created a new center because there was such a need for it. Other than the pandemic, which we all know had an effect, yeah. you said this started earlier. Yeah, so why absolutely. are we seeing all this? Um, I, the seismic shifts in um, the way we um, have a family, the way we have a school, the way we interact as humans. Um, you and I were chatting previously and talking about how we grew up. And yeah, you just kind of went outside. Yeah. I think our parents knew a lot less about what's going on in our world oh, yeah. because you couldn't text and be like, where are you? Right. You know, So we had almost less parental supervision, yeah. but we had more just go outside or you're bored, you right. know, I don't know what that you did. You watch TV, I yeah, guess, but. I rode my bike, yeah. you know, it was just more, you're, you're more independent and more outside of the house. Um, and just a lot more interactions, like actual human face-to-face -face interactions. Think about when you were younger, how many face-to-face -face human interactions did you have throughout the day? Right. Now think about your daughter, how many face-to-face -face human interactions is she having in a day? I mean, I guess when she goes to school yeah. and she goes to sports a lot. Uh, right. And then I kind of, you know, want to battle the phone a little bit yeah. at night, but I go, okay, she's been at school, she's been right. at sports. Yeah. Um, I, I, it drives me nuts that they can use Snapchat while they're doing their homework. I'm like, how does right. that help? But I like, agree. they think they can do it. They're yeah. like, yeah, it's fine. And right. then they answer something. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, but the difference being if that's all they're doing and right. they're not doing these other things the that they should be doing. Or going to school or, and, and they're just sitting at home, um, which is the reality for some of these kids. And another big part of, you know, just treating this and for parents to think about is that biochemically our kids, um, especially after really years of anxiety and depression or months of anxiety and depression are biochemically different. Okay. Um, and so they might need some medication. They might need a small dose of medication to really be able to get themselves out. And we really don't want kids self-medicating. Right. At all. So that's so, the other thing. People yeah. say, I don't want meds for my kids. And, and I, I hear it. I agree. So many times I've been like, okay, I don't want to do this. I want to do everything naturally. And we, we have so many great naturopaths who come on this yeah. show. Um, but who will also say that the first line of defense will be eating well, sleeping well, all this. But yeah. sometimes you might need a medication. Yeah. And, and what you're saying is sometimes it's an appropriate thing and it's a game changer. And yes. that we as parents shouldn't feel guilty of like... I'm medicating my kid. No, absolutely not. And the reality is, is that um, unfortunately we do see kids who self-medicate instead of with alcohol, um, with alcohol or, or drugs um, to reduce you know, the anxiety. To reduce the anxiety, and it works very, very well. But you know, it's a deep, dark hole that they're going into, which they're not aware of at that point. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, I really think. As parents, you know, destigmatizing and not feeling that shame or guilt um, if your child's going on a small dose of an antidepressant, or there are some really good um, beta blockers that can be used for anxiety that reduce your heart rate, don't have any psychotropic effects, mm -hmm. um, but work right away and give that person that relief. I, I've seen kids come in and cry because they have felt so out of control of their own bodies that when they're given a small dose of a medication that they can feel normal again, they then feel empowered to take control back and to be able to do some of the things that they've been wanting to do. Okay. So 
again, it might be a medication trial too. It, absolutely. You're not going to leave someone on something that isn't helping, but yeah. if you all of a sudden see a big difference, and we know SSRIs can take yeah. some time, you know, yes. so if you're dealing with this right now and going, what do I do? Um, it can take five weeks or so absolutely. before yeah. these medications really yeah. work. But uh, so let's decide that you, let's say you took that step. Mm -hmm. What should you notice? I know it's not just pills, it's pills and pills and skills. But oh yeah. Then how do we help? So um, in terms of one of the most important things is routine and structure. Okay. As humans, we need routine and structure. That's why the pandemic hurt everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it hurt everybody in every different capacity, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, making sure that they're on a regular sleep schedule and there are things you can use that are natural that are for sleep. You know, melatonin is a great one. Yep. Um, there's kava kava. There's a couple other. Um, I love know, kava kava ka tea when I really yeah. need to sleep. But um, for kids who might not want to drink tea. Yeah, um, there's pills. There's kava kava pills and melatonin at night. Uh, melatonin is naturally produced in your brain, mm -hmm. so it really is just a hormone that um, we produce when it's dark outside. Yeah. And so the you know the screens again, it's the screens that are disrupting our sleep and um, making us making it difficult for our minds to know where we are. Yeah. So we have to tell our mind it's time for bed. Yeah. It's time yeah. to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, blue light glasses. I actually have. Um, my blue light glasses on top of my head to really protect oh, yourself yeah. from um, screens during the day and at night. Um, that's a huge thing. Light is enormous. Um, like just getting out in nature can yeah, really help. Absolutely. Um, so if you think your teen really needs help, like mm -hmm. uh, whether it be therapy or something a little bit more intensive, like what you're offering with the mm -hmm. outpatient therapy, um, w you call. Hope well, yeah. Hope well Solutions. Yeah. And um, you'd, um, I talk to everybody personally that calls for a referral for IOP before they even come in. So you would be getting a phone call back from myself um, in terms of just making sure that that's the appropriate thing, um, what other um, resources um, you might need. Uh, and then we would set you up with an intake for the IOP and then a start date for the IOP. And you can tell from the intake, maybe this child just needs a therapist. Absolutely. Or maybe they just need a little medication. Like right. you're not automatically. No, no, no. Because no. you help people who are a little less uh, disturbed by anxiety or depression oh, yeah, also. Absolutely. You're right in Glastonbury. But the neat thing is, I, I don't know if we can pull up the picture of your uh, outpatient program, but it doesn't look like a scary place. It looks like you're out it's on the water place, yeah. and the yeah. kids look like they're having fun and they're smiling. Yeah. So here's the outside. And then um, I know you showed me, a, you sent me a picture of, you know, all these people outside on the, the water. Team, yeah, I think and we have at least one or two dogs out there. So yeah, okay, okay. yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's not a hospital setting. It's, um, you know, it's, a, it's, I actually have um, three locations in Glastonbury. Oh, so, okay. um, but one of them is a house um, which we renovated, which is very cozy and very nice. And then we have two suites in a medical office building and it's designed in Florida theme because that's, you know, if I can't be in Florida, that's I want it oh, to be. Oh, teens might like that. <laughs> so people might be saying, I, I don't know how to afford this. I need help from my kid. Yeah. But what do you do about that? Is insurance usually, if you have insurance, insurance is this covered? Insurance does cover it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we also look into that ahead of time before you come into the program. So if there is any copay cost or anything, it is discussed with you before you um, come in. So there's no hidden costs. There's nothing um, that happens unexpectedly. So I want to let everyone know it's Hopewell Health Solutions. You're in Glastonbury. I'll shout out the phone number. It's 860-946-0447. But you also have a website, hopewellhealthsolutions.com. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if you're, uh, most of the people listening to this are probably not a teen. They're probably a parent or someone who knows a teen and you might need help. But we should say that you also service adults. Absolutely. Yeah. So I have 25 um, people who work with me, including psychiatrists and doctors and nurses and therapists. So, um, and we have all different specialties. So we do see everybody from, um, you know, usually like three or four years old all the way up to um, geriatric. So a lot of people might be dealing with their pediatrician and the pediatrician saying, yeah. 
uh, okay, we're going to prescribe a, a, a medication or your child has ADHD, let's do a prescription mm -hmm. trial. And I, I love pediatricians and I think they're a great first yeah. step, but do you need someone outside of the pediatrician's office to really look at the mental health aspect? Yeah, so pediatricians are great generalists, um, but I personally would want to go to somebody who has a psychiatric background mm -hmm. um, just because there are so many different medications and it is rapidly changing in terms of um, if a medication is seemingly dangerous for certain populations or not and what works best or what combinations work best and um, psychiatrists are looking at only that instead yeah. of um, going to you know a generalist who looks at all the different diseases at the same time. So and nothing wrong if the pediatrician no. says, I'm going to give a prescription for Prozac or something like that. Let's get her started. And right. then you have some time to go maybe tweak it with a psychiatrist. Because yeah. people think I'm going on meds. It's the end of the story. Um, but uh, it's um, then you have the, the right dosage. And, and all of that that you need to figure out. Right, and you really should be going to, um, in our office we really see people on a regular basis for psychi psychiatric appointments, so it's not just like you come in once and then you see them three months later. We actually don't allow that. You um, come in for regular appointments, especially as when you start a new medication okay. so that we're really looking at you and making sure that you um, are doing well and if not then we immediate we react Im immediately How, what do you deal with a teen who doesn't want to go that is really tough I mean what I've done um, virtual visits um, with kids initially and even just having them sort of see like what you know what I'm like or what somebody on my team is like and what our office is like but for the most part, it's really only been one kid that didn't come in because they're just walking into like a, a medical office building mm -hmm. um, and we typically have one. But sometimes kids will say, I don't need therapy. I don't want a therapy. It's right. the same thing that you say, you need to go to a math tutor. I don't need a tutor. I mean, kids will say, I don't yeah. need this. And, yeah. and you as a parent, I know we have to sometimes say you do. Yeah. I would say that then the parent should be in therapy because you cannot make, if a kid is, is vehemently against going to therapy there is no point in putting really? your child in therapy well what are they going to do okay so then you know? it becomes more parent training and then it's just a it, it's just you're just butting heads with a teen who doesn't want to be there so oh, um okay you know i was I, thinking you're going to need to force them and this is good for you no, like eating I, vegetables i don't think i mean i personally wouldn't force it okay. i i would tell the teen well then i'll go to therapy myself and i'll learn different ways of working with you and you know maybe stuff that i need to work on for myself and okay. role model it for them okay you know um in our last bit of time together let's talk about the digital changes because um, there are some studies I was reading in the New York Times just today that there's an article where they were studying, you know, that anxiety really was peaking before mm -hmm. COVID with teens. Mm -hmm. And they were even noticing that on some like college campuses, it would go up with the advent of Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, so they were trying to tie it. Mm -hmm. It was no, no definitive answer yet right. from all the experts like you, but that there definitely seems to be a digital issue here that is driving some of the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no doubt um, that digital images and just the way a phone works um, increases anxiety. I mean, it's it's eye movement, it's overload of information, mm -hmm. it's not how people naturally are. So it's not like reading an article, right? Because when you if you read an article or you read a book, your eye is going back and forth mm -hmm. through the words and there's no extraneous images popping out at you. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're trying to read an article, there's videos popping up, there's other things popping up that are trying to get your attention. They're all vying for your attention. So your attention is split as soon as you open up that device mm -hmm. on your phone. But so I'm going to play devil's advocate that people say, well, this is the world they're living in it and is. they need to get ready it for is. a digital world. But like, yeah. what do you do as parents? What's your, uh, I know you said getting on a regular schedule, but I use screen time, you know, yeah. so it just, uh, I, I've tried to fight the battle of um, taking it away and that yeah. seems like more headbutting. Yep. So instead it goes off at a certain hour yeah. and um, I 
you know, my kids don't have access to it at night because everything shuts down. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but they're going to go to college someday. They're going to whatever. Like, they need to right. kind of mind themselves. Yeah. But what do you do if you're a parent so that you can take some control without that crazy headbutting that can kind of exacerbate everything? I like to engage kids in the conversation. Okay. So, like, what do you think about this? You know, and do you think as a family there's something we could do so that we all can learn how to be a little bit more mindful about using our devices and making we sure do too. we do too. So the best thing we can do is to role model it for our kids and ask them what do they think. And also ask them to be detectives. How does it make you feel when you've been on your phone for three hours in your bed? How do you feel after that? Uh -huh. How do you feel after you go out and you watch a basketball game at your son, at your kid's high school, at your high school, right? Yeah. How, what's the feeling that you have when you leave like a, an event with other teens that went yeah. there, right? And so like get them to start thinking about their energy and how they feel about different activities and how it makes them feel inside. Okay. Um, there's a lot of talk about meditation, that it's a panacea. I, I started a meditation practice years yeah. ago after starting this show and having everyone say you need a meditation practice and it can start with a minute or two. Yeah. But I find resistance with teens yeah. to talk about that or to do that on a regular basis, um, even though we know it could be very good for them. But are, are, are teens just different? Like, what do you recommend when you're dealing with teenagers? Well, I also think people are just different, yeah. right? So, and I don't think just sitting you know, and doing a Buddhist meditation has to be meditation. I yeah. mean, that's awesome. Could just you be walking outside and exactly. feeling your it feet on the ground. Could be walking. It could be going for a sprint, right? Getting, like, ask people, what do you do? What are you doing when you're in a flow? When you're in that flow and you're not thinking about other things, you're not looking at your phone, you're not worried about work, you're not worried about your kids, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, is it like swimming? Is it like taking a shower? Is it like what gives you that flow experience? And then that is really like a meditation. That is, a, you know, I talk about like a marble jar, like, you know, you do healthy things during the day that fill up your marble jar, right? And yeah. then there's certain things that drain that marble jar, right? And you so know? no one has to be perfect. No, no. I mean, they're going to go on their phones, I guess, yeah. or their iPads or their Xbox. But the problem that you're seeing with some teens who might need the IOP program is the parents are lost. They don't know how to bring them back. These yeah. kids are totally off their yep. schedule. They're some of them not even going to school. Right. So in our final moment together, just to say what this is, if you happen to be in Glastonbury, Connecticut, uh, or yeah. in Connecticut, yeah. do you take people from out of state also? Uh, no, they have to, well, they can, yes, they can drive. Okay. We take we have taking people from Greenwich and um, Ridgefield. People have been driving. So generally, it's going to be for Connecticut folks, and if not, hopefully there's some place in your state. But HopewellHealthSolutions.com. They're going to come, and they're going to come three or four days a week, and yes. be in like about a three-hour thing with other teens. Because you said yes. actually, the individual therapy is only so helpful. You want them to be in groups to get yeah. better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they create a natural connection amongst themselves, okay. which is super important. They don't feel so isolated. They see other families and teens in the same type of situation. It's not exactly the same, but really one of the big things is, is to get out of yourself and into the world. Okay. Right? Yep, to get yeah. back out there. Yeah. So uh, again, it's HopewellHealthSolutions.com if you want to check that out, if you want to share this content with someone who might need it. Um, there's the team right there. They look happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not scary like some of the yeah. folks. And so I think it's great that you're creating this. And I know there's such a need. Um, so if... Uh, if you want to share this with someone you love, definitely share the podcast or the YouTube video. Uh, you can find more content on the cutting edge of wellness by following me on social media at Kara Sundlin on all the platforms. And I like to share this content there. Dr. K, thank you so thank much. You. Thank right. you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and be Bye. well.